let's get started. Uh, I want to introduce our three panelists. Uh, thank you so much for being here. First off, we have uh, Stephen Lee, who's a designer and educator. He has a background in branding, motion, interactive and experience design. He's an assistant professor in the graphic design program at Portland State. And I've actually collaborated with him on some hubs projects in the past for study a nonprofit here in Portland. Uh, so Stephen, thank you. Uh, we have Dylan Fox, part of the coordination and engagement team for XR Access, an organization dedicated to making virtual and augmented reality experiences accessible to people with disabilities. Um, he also works as a researcher at the University of California, in Berkeley, uh, and he's studying how AR can help people with low vision navigate real world obstacles, uh, doing some really cool work. Dylan, thanks. And uh, lastly, but definitely not least, Mar gonzalez a uh, principal researcher at Microsoft's Extended Perception, Interaction, and Cognition Lab, EPIC. And uh, one last note is that, uh, you know, I'm using VR, but I think for the purposes of this panel, uh, I will extend that to XR. So uh, are you all ready? Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Mar, I first came across your work when I discovered the Locomotion Vault. And I'd love to share, I'd love to have you share it actually, um, and, and maybe talk about it a little bit. Um, for me, it was the perfect case study in the hubs experience I was building around what's being explored in terms of different ways of getting around in VR. So will you share a little bit more about what led you to build this? I mean, this is, um, you know, many times uh, we find a problem that is a problem for us and it's probably a problem for many other people too. And, and that the applies to accessibility in many cases, right? Uh, we find a problem in a general public or in accessibility and transfers to the general public or from general public to the uh, accessible community. And I think this sort of uh, um, interaction is even much bigger in VR and AR, right? We're, we're still learning from the technology. So I wanna share a bit what this uh, locomotion bolt is first. So the locomotion bolt is more of a, a dynamic visual uh, exploration and database that is supposed to grow as the community grows also, because I think this is a very early times. So one of the things we did here, let me make this a bit bigger, um, is we started, and you know, I've been working for a while in VR. I did some accessibility and uh, locomotion tools myself before uh, like the um, ground level scaling in I'm a giant, right? Is work that we presented a couple of years back uh, with multiple ways of moving across this very large space. And one of the things we found is that there are so many ways to move around. So I, I talked to Max Diluc one of my co-authors in, in this work. Uh, at the early days, we were like, hey, let's look at how many locomotion techniques are out there, right? Very much exploratory. And also we know that the research arena maybe has not moved as fast as, for example, some development. So we were like, it doesn't matter if it hasn't been published, right? Like if it's out there and people are using it, we're interested. And I think it was around when we got to 20 of them that we realized this was going to be on a different scale of numbers. And in fact, we have over 100 techniques in the database right now that I'm sure we're missing some. Uh, when we enroll also Hasti, Sefi, um, into preparing this Docomotion Bolt, uh, she's an expert in, in visualizing databases uh, this way also. So. Uh, partially, the idea here is that whatever you need, right, if you need some sort of uh, controller technique or, you know, I want to use gaze only, um, you could search for it, right? Look, you want something that uh, creates a lot of spatial awareness, requires very low energy, and you can multitask. And then you, you have reduced the number of possible things that you can use, right? And, and this is, for example, one possible technique. Um, you have things like uh, dash joisting. Um, there, there are many options, right? And, and some are super 
crazy and hard to even understand just uh, by description. So we introduced uh, this idea that um, you can visualize it a little bit more. And then also YouTube videos, possible games that you can try to, to try what it feels like, right? For example, this is a technique that you're in third person, but you can also teleport and be in first person, right? right. So it gives you this overview and also the detail of interacting in first person perspective. And this comes also a little bit from this idea that we published a couple of years back on, you know, it's an opportunity for virtual reality that we, we think of accessible design from the start, right? Um, you know, there are very few technologies in which we have had this awareness of accessibility before we even started creating things. And I think VR is, is one of them. Uh, I welcome people to go through these. Uh, you know, there are all sorts of things, things that only require hand movements, um, things that are based in controllers. And I want to go a little bit from all of the analysis we did after we introduced everything in the database. Um, you know, we, we look at what other people had done before, what type of categories they use, uh, all these taxonomies, what they were finding. And then we kind of created this massive database out of all these uh, exterior, um, uh, uh, you know, previous work. But we didn't want to propose a taxonomy because I feel like there are so many gaps yet that you're like, you should be able to describe the whole thing before you can. Uh, so we are, we're more into this idea that, okay, we're going to put sort of the same type of uh, categories and, and attributes that were used before. And then we're going to find similarities, right? Try to classify things. Uh, we also did a bit of an interesting ex uh, demographic experiment on the locomotion techniques, how they've been exploding. There are many more appearing. Um, let me get a bit closer. So you can see this, right? In, in different categories, you know, movement seems to be one that grows very fast uh, because of this embodied aspect of VR, but I feel like controller are a few of the, the things that can grow bigger for accessibility, rely more on controllers or maybe on gestures than complete movements, right? Uh, you require a full ability to be on the movement side. So it's kind of interesting, the whole analysis we do. We also go through a symbolic regression, but at the end of the day, we, this, we find these three main aspects that are key to access uh, to, to locomotion. And one is that how accessible the locomotion technique is, whether it creates nausea. So the less accessible, the closer to, to real life, right? In room scale. And that reduces nausea because you have a better one-to-one -one of your vestibular. Uh, you have more limitation of movements, right? Because you're restricted to your basic movements. But the moment you move towards, you know, things that are more abstract, like a controller, you can be much more accessible, but it doesn't use more nausea. And you can have many more types of movements, right? Like acceleration, uh, 6D off, flying, things like that, that you will never do if you're on a one-to-one. -one. So I think that kind of summarizes a little bit what the locomotion bolt is. And I, you know, I'm happy to talk more about it, but. I think we have a whole set of speakers here today. Yeah, thank you for sharing it. And people can share their own locomotion methods if they're aware of, of others that are out there, right? Yeah, you can share it there. We introduce it well. I mean, we, we look at it. Um, the Also the idea of this locomotion bolt is that as you're exploring things, you might find a gap, right? Like, uh, and recently I was in the XR bootcamp and there is a person there doing a lot of things with hands, right? Like now that hand trackings are out there uh, and he's sort of like getting all these locomotion techniques and what, how would it work if it was with hands? Mm. Um, so it's very interesting because the same thing can happen with gaze, right? Like how can I make this better if I have gaze control, right? 
um, and I feel like this will allow for many more techniques to come out. I hope we see this explosion exponentially. And the way I see this moving forward, I'm I'm setting up as a, a sort of a challenge for university students with different professors. Uh, it will be announced soon, but we're gonna try to create a repo with all these techniques implemented. So you end up having sort of a, a passport. Like if you're building a game, you just use this repository and then it's up to the user to select, oh, I wanna use these three different types of locomotion. And then it's a passport for you. You bring it to the different games, right? Um, I do feel like there is not gonna be a winner locomotion technique, even on games like Alex. Now we see a lot of, um, you know, they, they even should allow you to have three different techniques for locomotion while you are playing. So I feel like this multiversality of uh, different locomotion techniques will be there. Definitely the configurability uh, to just let people choose what works best for them. Uh, speaking of, of kind of some hand tracking and things, is, uh, Dylan, I know you uh, did a little presentation about sign language in VR and XR and some of the mm -hmm. things that people are doing there. And you also uh, helped to organize XR Access, you know, a community that I found really helpful when I was starting to research this project. Will you say more about what else you see XR Access contributing to the field or, or what, what you experienced with the, uh, the hand tracking? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first of all, Mike, thanks, thanks for having me here. Um, it's really great to uh, be able to come on and, and speak to you all about accessibility and whatnot. Um, so XR Access, just to give a little introduction, is, yes, yeah, as, as mentioned, it's a, a basically a community that's uh, dedicated to uh, ensuring that virtual and augmented reality are accessible um, to people with disabilities. And, you know, I think one of the things that the big things that we're doing with XR Access is we do, we have, of course, um, you know, we kind of started out uh, as this attempt to, to, to kind of coordinate and archive and, and make sure that we, we have an understanding of just what resources are out there. Um, Mar, we've definitely got the, the locomotion vault in there now. I, 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 as soon as I saw it at the, uh, the boot camp thing last, uh, last week, I knew I had to, had to get that in there. Um, but something that the else that I think we're doing is that, you know, I kind of realized early on when I was studying XR accessibility is that it, it's really cross-disciplinary, um, more than a, a lot of other kind of areas right now. Um, to make XR accessibility happen, you need to have a lot of people with very different skill sets collaborating. Um, you need to have accessibility experts, you need to have uh, VR and AR designers and developers, um, you need to have researchers, you need to have um, professionals in kind of education and healthcare um, and all the areas that we want to actually, you know, put XR to good use in. Um, and there's a lot of different people um, from a lot of diff very different types of organizations that, that really need to come together in order to have, have buy-in on this to make things accessible. Um, so in addition to providing resources, a big part of what XR Access is trying to do moving forward is basically to serve as this kind of boundary organization, um, you know, bringing together all these different people um, and making sure that everyone is communicating in ways that other people can understand. Um, we're trying to make sure all these different stakeholders are both getting what they need um, from other people uh, in a, a way that they can understand. Um, and making sure that their expert knowledge is making it into the final result um, on a lot of these different apps and platforms and so on. Um, so I think having events like this and you know having Mozilla has been consistently uh, a really active participant in these discussions, um, which is excellent. Uh, and so making sure that you know, for example, Mozilla has the the input it needs from any of these other groups that are involved in this space uh, is the, the type of thing that we really want to make sure happens. Thank you. Yeah. And, and speaking of someone who has been through many different disciplines himself, Stephen, I know you have a background in interactive experience design. You've built installations for big public gatherings. You also teach students in a physical classroom and have been digging really into hubs quite a bit yourself. I imagine for you, um, the world has, has shifted quite a lot in the past few years. Can you talk about uh, the experience of, of building an XR curriculum? Yeah, um, I, I think to, to give it some context first is, <clears throat> you know, I, I teach at Portland State University, which is a public university in Oregon. Um, and the population that we serve is, is 
pre-diverse. We have um, people who are first generation college students. We have uh, older students, veterans, um, and people with learning disabilities, uh, other disabilities, and, and uh, a really wide range of socioeconomic backgrounds, which I think all of those things kind of <clears throat> affect people's access to this new technology. And when, you know, when COVID hit and we had to kind of scramble and change the way we were delivering this, it, it sort of um, exacerbated some of the sort of issues that we were already seeing in the classroom, you know, like access to technology or uh, just, you know, the different backgrounds that we're trying to, um, trying to accommodate. So, um, you, you know, like I, right before this hit, we, you know, we were like looking at VR headsets and trying to like, uh, think about how to um, provide the technology in the classroom. And then once we went remote, it was like, we kind of have to work with whatever, uh, what people have at their disposal. And so I think, you know, Hubs was actually a really nice tool in that sense, because it, it was so accessible to students with, with like maybe lower technology um, resources. And also, you know, there is that kind of accessibility component throughout um, built into it, yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah, uh, I want to, uh, in the interest of time, uh, kind of shift the conversation to prioritizing accessibility um, and and providing that use case uh, for folks to uh, to push this work forward in in their own disciplines. Um, I had a conversation recently with Asa Dotzler from the Firefox Accessibility Team, and he phrased things really interestingly uh, for me. He said that. Uh, when we build digital experiences, we are building the barriers. Uh, it's not that we we build a thing and then we we allow ways to to get around them. Um, we're actually imposing those restrictions um, as we build things. Um, and so, I'm curious for each of you uh, if you have any thoughts on this. Why should we be focusing on accessibility? I'm happy to jump in here. Um... For me, I came to accessibility first from UX design. Um, it's kind of where I originally uh, got my start. Uh, and one of the, the kind of constant mantras of UX design, like the, the, the first commandment in the UX design Bible is know your users' needs and design for your users' needs. Um, and when you think about the fact that literally one in four people in the United States has a disability, um, if you're going to design something that, you know, up to a quarter of your users might not be able to use, you know, that really kind of reflects poorly on you as a designer. Uh, I think something that we often forget is that people don't inherently have problems because of their disabilities. They have problems because we don't consider their disabilities in design, right? Um, you know, if you look at the the deaf community, for example, um, a, a lot of a lot of people are are proud to be deaf. They consider being deaf part of their culture. Um, and a, a lot of the the times in the past when people have offered, oh, hey, look, here's, you know, this cochlear implant that will will cure your deafness. Um, there's a lot of people that that really don't like that. They say that you're trying to erase a part of who I am. Um, and so for people in that position. Um, having things like captions, having accessibility features that let them participate and let them use your applications, that is just good design. Um, and the, the problem isn't that they're deaf. The problem is that you didn't consider their deafness in your design process. I want to jump there. I think we're in front of the one of the first times in which a newer technology is uh, that is supposed to replace right the other technologies is less accessible. Um, than the existing one, right? Like from very simple things like how do you put it on, right? It's a wearable and some people cannot really have that type of mobility to, to put on a whole headset. Um, to uh, things like uh, Dylan was saying, read, uh, readability, like uh, with the current um, screens and optics that we have on consumer, like barely you can print text on the center, right? So it will occupy, uh, like if you put it down there, probably you're not gonna be able to read it at least if you're using Fresnel. It's getting better, right? Like the resolution is gonna get better. The uh, optics will get better, but uh, so far. And the last one is the embodied part of it, right? Like this idea that, um, you substitute your body when you are in VR 
And well, if your body is not able, uh, fully able of movement, that transfers. Okay, so I feel like th these are a few challenges that transcend just the consumer. It applies also to an accessible work environment, to you know how how, how our company is gonna put this as their main devices. Uh, you have to comply with even to the basic level of regulations, right? Uh, so I do feel like um, all of these challenges are very, they are important, right? For adoption even. Yeah, I, I know even for me with, with certain VR experiences, I don't have a, a big room uh, to be able to use VR. And I was playing some game uh, and I kept smashing my fists on <laughs> the furniture and walls around me. And, and so even, you know, if you think about accessibility as the, the access to technology and to space, um, Stephen, you probably, you know, have students coming from, from all these different backgrounds that you mentioned uh, who have different differing levels of access to technology. Did you encounter that like with the hubs experience that you built um, for your students gallery? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, um, with that experience and also just teaching online, I would just have, I would realize some things that, like that I took for granted, you know, a steady internet connection or um, the ability to like uh, have multiple browser windows open and have things running smoothly. Like th those are things that I hadn't thought would be an issue. And like and trying to troubleshoot those things virtually is, is really, really difficult. And so um, that was a lot of what we were like trying to play with, like trying to optimize the experience so that it was like, it was accessible, right? On, on lower end devices or uh, on a phone, let's say, right? Um, I, I was gonna say like in terms of accessibility, I think, um, you know, when we design things for people at the margins, it's, it, we make a better product for everyone. And that's important. I also think there's this like, I, and there's accessibility and there's also this idea of inclusion and, and bringing, uh, people from different backgrounds or other voices in and I think especially like in this environment looking at um, you know people from like BIPOC communities or you know just other like getting making sure that we're not just like listening to one voice is is really important in this as we develop this technology. Yeah that's actually a really great segue uh, into a question I had for you Mark. Um, when I was researching this project um, Microsoft kept coming up around accessibility research and innovation um, and uh, someone mentioned to me that that Microsoft just actively weaves accessibility into the fabric of, of how things are built from the start, um, including recruiting folks with disabilities and a culture that sees uh, focusing on accessibility as a route towards building those, those better projects uh, and products. Um, can you talk a little bit yeah, about- Yeah, like I mean, I, I think uh, we have a very good track on these. There is always more to be done, of course, but uh, I want to put an example of another project I'm involved on the accessibility arena that also shows the potential of these technologies to impact the life of a person who has limitations is much higher even than what we think of the general public. And I think uh, the project Soundscape, I don't know if you ever tried this Microsoft Soundscape app, uh, which is meant to allow navigation uh, in a much easier way for uh, folks who are blind or, you know, uh, with the vision uh, limitations, quite large vision limitations. It's mostly based on uh, audio beacons. So the idea here is instead of using the regular GPS navigation of turn right, turn left, it's more of an auditory experience uh, in which you have a sound coming from a particular destination that you select, right? Uh, and then that guides you there. Uh, even from an anthropological perspective, it's much more natural for humans to go in that direction, right? Like when we were foraging in the forest, we would hear, you know, uh, some sort of water source, uh, you know, some uh, waterfall, some river. We would walk towards there. We will create a mental map and be able to return. GPS navigation nowadays, how many times you get somewhere and you don't remember how you got there, right? With the turn right, turn left. Um, so it's even, a, you know, undermining our own decision making and our own mental abilities uh, in the general public. But for blind folks to discover things around them on their own, 
this is just a, a mind-blowing thing because they generally have been trained to learn a specific route with that trainer uh, and this tool allows them that once they are confident with the tool um, you know what uh, actually the lead on this project who is blind himself often tells the story of you know I got off the wrong stop in the bus and this thing saved it <laughs> Right, like I was able to to just navigate to where I was supposed to go, uh, despite missing my bus stop. Uh, and it, it encompasses a bunch of more things, like um, uh, you know, it, it tells you as you're walking what is around you. So it means that you can use it even when you're on the car, or like it gives you much more uh, mental awareness of of things surrounding you. Uh, and this is a particular case of what uh, Stephen was saying, right? Like we create this tool that is very much focused on this opportunity for uh, supporting this very large number of people if you look globally. And in fact, we're in six countries already. Uh, we recently launched in Brazil. And, you know, this is a research project. It's, it's a product from Microsoft, but it comes from research. And, and what we're seeing is that this type of GPS navigation is better than turn by turn and we're trying to push this type of navigation even for the general public right like imagine if you could have this on big maps or um so so I'm, i think that oftentimes we learn things here that can transfer to the other side and the other reason why i like this project a lot is because it doesn't focus it's an augmented reality experience it's a virtual reality experience spatial computing focus on blind users, <laughs> which generally you're like, oh, you know, VR doesn't work for blind people. And you're like, well, think of it as a spatial computing. Think of it as the content now is around us instead of inside a screen. And in fact, if you think it this way, it's probably more accessible to blind population than it was before, because before it was truly only on the screen and now it's around you. So you can perceive it in many new ways. And I think um, the experience of Soundscape, you, you can try it, you can download it. Uh, it it's very interesting in that sense. It, it opens new ideas of um, accessibility in, in XR. Uh, yeah, this is the tool, and, and this is how, um, uh, damn it, I, I'll share it again with audio. <laughs> uh, I'll just uh, go very quickly. I don't want to take a lot of time with this, but I think it's, you know, one of these tools that uh, gives a very different experience. A busy city street, Maya with her guide dog. Good boy, steady. Steady, good boy. Aaron Luridson. So one of the interesting things is we're not trying to replace tools that uh, blind folks are used to, right? Like you still use your cane or your dog for the immediate mobility. This is more about the spatial mapping of where are you in the world? Because it's designed such that you can just put it in your pocket and go. Maya using Soundscape, walking with Alex. DSW Shoe Warehouse. DSW Shoe Warehouse. Yeah. Cool things happening around town here. <laughs> when I'm with other people, I'm able to gather a lot of the same information my sighted friends or family are getting from the signage around me. And with that, I'm able to participate in, hey, look, what's over there? Desigual. Oh, Desigual is showing up here as well, which is one of my favorite stores. Oh, really? Yeah. Those moments that don't usually happen for me in my life. David, walking in the park. Using the technology is relatively easy. You have to still concentrate on listening for obstacles, but you then get used to the chatter in the background and you can pick out suddenly something that's of interest to you. Shona around town. It was great Tell me all the different shops as I passed, which is lovely. And the different street names as well. Quite often I don't know, you know, which street's which. Approaching intersection. Battery goes right. Maya touching phone screen. We have a, a beacon set for Nike store, 248 yards. The beacon has been helpful in approaching different addresses and places in busier areas. Arm extended, pointing with her phone. I'm getting the bell right about here. Great, so let's just head off that way. Okay, forward. 
passing through an open market. It's been a unique experience to work with the Soundscape team. They have been so transparent, forthcoming, open to feedback. It's been a really dynamic relationship. You have blind people on your team, you're working deeply with agencies like Lighthouse and reaching out and engaging with blind people in different places and from different backgrounds and really making sure that what's being created is aligned with the needs of the community. Ah, fiddler forward. So I'll leave it there, but you see it has different tools in it like this. I want to go here to, I want to know what's around me uh, from things that are like what the stores are, what the, and it's, um, a few of the things that we were very focused on the creation of this tool is one, it works on phones, which is something people already have. You can like as a head, uh, headphones and um, other options of uh, head tracking are coming available. We're incorporating them like the Bose uh, head um uh, sunglasses that have uh, head tracking. But if you have your phone, you can use the phone to point, right? Like it has a, a, a way to, to navigate this way to. Um, so it's, you know, it's compatible with current technology. We try to make it forward compatible with future technology too. And I feel like um, the, the partnerships with current um, teams that are already helping people to navigate, right? Like to, to learn how to move. Uh, they give them the dog and the app. They teach them over a couple of few weeks and then they, they go on their own. And I feel like that's the perfect uh, partnership also, right? So I oftentimes, uh, I worry in the accessibility community that you need to have the right partner. Right, there is like a million types of gloves created for uh, signaling, million types of, uh, you know, it's like maybe that's not what the community needs. Uh, so I, I feel like um, in order to really do that, having inside the company, people like Amos Miller, for example, who is the lead on this, who is blind himself, right? It gives you a very different perspective. And you look at the app and the app is, it's not super nice visually, but it, it doesn't matter because it reads super nice through the screen reader. The, it does the things that it needs to do uh, for a blind population. Yeah, speaking of that that community angle, Dylan, I know you were the one that kind of introduced me to the phrase, uh, nothing about us without us or nothing nothing for us without us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in your work with XR Access, I'm sure you must uh, encounter that, that need to collaborate across disciplines and across organizations a lot. Yeah. Um, can you think of like a couple of like key or, or easy entry, low hanging fruit accessibility ideas that you would recommend to folks to incorporate into how they design and build things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the, the, the single biggest thing you can do is, uh, you know, as Mar was saying, get people with disabilities on your team. Um, and failing that, at least make sure that you're testing with them because, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you some tips here, but, but I think that's, that's absolutely the biggest one is, is getting people, um, as you said, nothing, uh, nothing about us without us. And I think a lot of that sometimes has changed to simply nothing without us. Um, meaning make sure that you're, you're designing things with the, just hand in hand with the, the, the people that you're trying to help. Um, that being said, I, uh, I think two things that I think a lot of, uh, XR developers could really benefit from um, in terms of accessibility. One is make sure that your app can be used by someone seated uh, with one hand or no hands um, without having to kind of twist or lean over in your chair or stand up and walk around. Um, because doing that is not only going to make it uh, accessible to a, a wide variety of people with mobility impairments, um, is also going to mean that somebody can use your app on an airplane or seated in a, a cubicle, right? Um, and not have to, to, to even if you're able-bodied, you know, apps that expect you to duck and dodge and dive and roll, or even just to like go up here and go down there and, and do a lot of physical, physical movement. Um, those are going to be less accessible and they're just going to be tiring and they're going to be limiting to the, the limiting your app to people with the space necessary for those kinds of movements. Um, so that's one. Uh, and then two is a 
just a, a big thing in, in VR as it is in 2D, include captions. Um, you should be able to use your experience muted um, and not get stuck, right? Um, that's just something that that is almost everywhere now in 2D design, but in, in XR, it, we're kind of having to, to do it all over again. Um, and it is tricky because captions in XR, you can't just put them at the bottom of the screen um, because, you know, let's say I have somebody talking on my left and then an alarm starts blaring on my right. You know, ideally these captions should be placed in A, you know, somewhere that's comfortable to read. B, it should tell me a little bit about maybe who's talking or in what direction I need to look in order to see them. Um, and, you know, these, are, these aren't trivial challenges and hopefully soon we'll have APIs um, that you can just tap into so you don't have to kind of do all this from scratch. But nonetheless, I think captions are just so helpful for so many people, um, you know, hearing or not, uh, that I, I have to put them as the other kind of shout out here of, of if you have to pick, you know, one or two accessibility features, these are, these are the ones to get. Um, if you want to, to read a bunch more, just really, uh, you know, low hanging fruit. Yeah, things that are, if you're just thinking about them during the design process, they're not hard to do. Um, go to xraccess.org slash resources. Um, and I'll put this in the chat here in a minute. Uh, and we've got, you know, a, a bunch of really excellent resources, including um, the XR Association. Uh, one of our partners just put out a, uh, you know, 10 page or so um, guide to accessibility uh, and inclusive design in immersive experiences. Um, and it'll give you kind of a rundown of here's the, the kind of top features that uh, people, you know, benefits people with visual disabilities, the benefit people with hearing disabilities, kind of so on and so forth. Um, so, so definitely check that out and uh, just, just try to, to always keep in mind, you know, think about users that, that are different than you. Think about users that, you know, think of your, uh, you know, I think uh, somebody just put a great question in the chat about like children and elders, you being able to use XR. Think about those users. Think about the, the people that um, not only are permanently disabled, but that maybe have something else going on in the background. Think about people that are doing something else with one hand or multitasking. Your, your accessibility features will benefit them too. Um, so take a look at those guides, spread them around, um, and it's, it's going to make applications for everyone better, I think. It will be exciting to see those advancements uh, taking place. And, and I guess with that in mind, for, for any of you, are there particular things you see on the horizon that you're really excited about? I'll just do a quick one. Um, I'm really excited about OpenXR. Um, I think having a lot of, of different groups, different platforms using this kind of common um, platform um, that hopefully, you know, soon we're, we're one of our big goals for XR Access is to, to work with groups like OpenXR to make sure that if you want to include captions, let's make it easy for you. Let's not make you have to reinvent the wheel. Um, so seeing things like that and seeing things like the, the locomotion vault where, uh, I, I'm not sure right now why, whether it includes like code snippets and whatnot, but, uh, I'd love to see a future where people can just kind of take these known accessible techniques and just kind of dip in and having, adding it to your unity project, your unreal project be as easy as downloading a plugin, um, or, you know, that type of thing I, I think is, is really exciting. What hopefully we'll be seeing soon. I want to add here because I feel like. In general, one of the areas that is a bit underserved for the VR AR community is um, creation tools, right? Authoring tools. And that gets even more exacerbated for um, everything that is, uh, you know, on the, on the sides of uh, the, what is mainstream. And I feel like, um, I, at least I am trying to build a lot of open sourcing to um, work around this, right? Like I've been open sourcing avatars, open sourcing uh, motion capture tools for avatars. <laughs> and now the locomotion uh, techniques uh, that I'm gonna try to implement an open source also uh, with you know a global force of people because once you have this amount of um, techniques, it becomes kind of, um, it's not a work of a one person at this point. Uh, so I am also engaging a lot with external collaborators 
for this open sourcing uh, work. And I think that's the only way we get to the plugin levels that uh, Dylan is talking about. But I think authoring tools in general are still not for, you know, where is the scratch of VR? Where is the, uh, you know, all these things. And then going back a bit to, to what uh, Dylan was saying also on the, on the captioning that needs to be attached to particular events also. And I feel in general, um, we need to put uh, these new devices and they will also change over time into the public. Uh, and see how they respond to it. And then what we will see is uh, maybe a website doesn't look like a website at all once you're in VR, right? Or maybe, so I do think that um, one of the way to get to there is, um, if you look at the day, we have 24 hours. We can have two hours of maximum of entertainment gaming or whatever if you have kids forget about that so you have maximum your eight hours of work and i think that and then you sleep and eat and it's, 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 so i think those eight hours is when you can really introduce new technologies is through the productivity area and and if you think of a portable device that you know uh, has a lot of real estate and uh, you know more than one screen in theory you can render all of that inside a VR headset so that would be kind of the entry point I think that makes more sense for for most of people and once you're there you're gonna figure out okay well now gaming doesn't look like traditional gaming now you know I sort of feel like we we have started by putting trying to put these devices very much on areas that are hard to enter. And, but we will learn a lot when we put them as a replacement of the laptop, as a replacement of, right? And then we will figure out many new things. And it is an opportunity, right? As we're saying for, for accessibility that we can design from the scratch being accessible it's not happening yet on the large scale. I would say that it's again going just for the general public. Even VR headsets are, are not ready for kids, right? Like it's a super large population. I'm not even talking about disabilities there uh, who cannot even wear a headset uh, because they, it's not meant for their IPD, right? <laughs> so I, I do feel like there is a lot of work there too. So it is on authoring tools and on this whole idea that um, there is no diversity in, in how things are built and we don't know how things will actually look like. Yeah, I was surprised. It kind of what got me down this path in the first place to learn more about VR accessibility was just the fact that I came across, um, I think it was in November or December, Oculus posted their first VR accessibility like design guidelines and and they've been around for you know eight eight years and are just now getting around to, to that aspect of it so uh, clearly yeah has a long long way to go um, Stephen I, I'm curious you know from your perspective in in virtual education you must have students really you know wishing or asking for you know different features than what they're they're being given in in the the sort of like Zoom classroom environment I know. Zoom fatigue is a thing we hear a lot about. Um, are there, there things you kind of see on the horizon or, or have on your wish list? There are some things that Zoom does well. And, uh, you know, like being able to have this like synchronous conversation, being able to like monitor everyone. Like, you know, if everyone turns their cameras on and you're able to see faces, I feel like you get a little bit more feedback than, you know, uh, in one of my classes, we were building uh, uh, hubs and we were in there and it was, you know, we're all avatars and it's like sometimes kind of hard to know like oh this is this person understanding what i'm saying or you know what how is this person responding um but i i think what worked really well is like you know we were building out a space and we were building an exhibition and so to be to be able to prototype something that um and at scale and to experience it these are things that are kind of hard to do in in the real world at, at scale like you know if, if we wanted to build an exhibition and walk around in it, it would be really hard. Or if like, you know, I've done projection mapping with classes, but that requires certain technology and like light conditions and things like that. And now we could just throw up a video 
in a virtual space and kind of test that out and experience that. So that that was, um, I think that was helpful. And I also think people will just, uh, with this new technology, they'll kind of figure things out. I think people are figuring out how to use Zoom effectively and people are figuring out how to use hubs or other um, XR technology. I think, you know, we had like a, a gallery opening, I guess. And, you know, just, it was interesting to see the way people like started figuring out how to use the tools or like one person was, like dancing by like moving their mouse really quickly, you know, like, and just seeing that uh, was, was kind of interesting. So. Yeah. yeah the, the improvisation and, and the techniques that people find to, to make things their own and, and feel right for them is, is really fascinating. Actually that brings up Dylan. Um, I, it, an example I saw in one of your videos um, where somebody was using, I think it was VR chat and, and the hand tracking there to come up with like essentially like a new form of sign language that, that, got around the issue that you can't use all of your, you know, five fingers on both hands to sign in VR. Uh, there are the good examples you've seen of that where people are kind of, you know, coming up with their own solutions. You know, people period, when they have goals, when they put their minds to things, they will try to come up with workarounds to make it, make it work. Right. Um, you just look at Minecraft and the shenanigans people got up to making custom computers and not using minecarts. You can see an example of that. Um, I think when it comes to, to things like sign language, it's an interesting example because, you know, there's definitely the group of people, there's going to be some, you know, some deaf folks that, that really absolutely have seen this, this thing they want to participate in and they will, um, you know, come up with, you know, for example, the 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 case in point here is um, uh, basically a, a kind of suite of signs that make advan take advantage of the fact that some of the early VR controllers give you basically big mittens. You know, you can't control each finger independently, um, and so these you know folks would would come up with kind of an alternate dialect almost that that makes that feasible. Um, now, of course, I, I've talked to some deaf folks about this since then, and you know, some of them say, well, oh, you know, that's that's great that people are doing it. Others say, well. You might as well ask people to join voice chat, but they have to have this thing stuck on their mouth the whole time, and they'll come up with an alternate dialect that lets them you know, like, talk around it. Um, I think we it's it's fantastic to see examples of the this like where the, the community is is forging their own way, and it's great to learn from that um, and to try to to use those statistics examples to make the core experience better. Um, I think it's also important that, that we try to make sure that we we can make these things accessible without asking certain certain groups of people to make these huge compromises in in how they use the applications and how they communicate. Um, so I think it's it's both excellent, you know, inspiring, but also kind of a cautionary tale. Um, and I, I think it's something that we we definitely should should learn from and look to the ways that people are are taking this and making it their own and try to adapt those and make it make it better with them. I see we're we're running short on time, but to kind of bring it back to, you know, the community and to to what all of us can be thinking about, um, you know, when I ask you um, what you wanted to make sure we covered in the session, uh, you phrased it really well. You said uh, the connections that will need to be made between the people that understand the need for accessibility, those that understand the how, and those who are actually in a position to implement these accessible interfaces and hardware. Um, so for all of us here and, and uh, elsewhere who want to see this moving forward to convince those decision makers, money people, that this stuff should be prioritized. What's one piece of advice that uh, we can walk away with from the session to help make that happen? Yeah, um, I think the, the big one is that accessibility isn't just the ethical thing to do. It also makes really good business sense. Um, you know, one in four people in the U.S. are disabled, um, which means that inaccessible applications are leaving behind a lot of kind of potential customers and, and money on the table. Um, and what's more, a lot of buyers in government, in education, in healthcare, and in industry are legally required to only purchase accessible software. Um, I think you'll find for a lot of enterprise clients, accessibility is really part of those kind of minimum requirements. Um, and so if you want, uh, you know, it, this is in addition, of course, to the fact that making apps accessible makes them better for everybody, whether whether they have permanent disabilities or not, because all of us are in places where we have kind of temporary or situational disabilities. Um, and that curb cut effect uh, is definitely real. Um, I think one of the, the, the things we, we realize, of course, that accessibility often gets 
left behind is oh kind of we'll get back to this later um type type thing when really it, it needs to be part of the minimum viable product um, and I think that that's why for us at XR Access, one of the, the big things that we're going to be doing, one of our core pillars um, is business cases for inclusive XR. Um, we're going to be compiling, uh, you know, use cases, uh, case, case studies, uh, you know, all kinds of things that will help kind of managers and executives and whatnot who maybe don't have either a design development background or an accessibility background, but they know kind of what needs to happen in terms of everything else to make an app launch, um, we're going to be making resources uh, kind of by them and for them. And so if that's something you're interested in, you know, you don't need to have a, a, back, a technical background in order to contribute to this discussion. Um, so definitely come by, you know, XR Access and, and, and help contribute to that conversation. Thanks, yeah. Mar or Steven, do you have any, uh, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I feel like, um... I'm not coming from the accessibility group per se. We're sister groups in uh, in in the in in the research org, and I work a lot, right? Like I work on soundscape. I come more from neuroscience perception and and also real time systems in computer science. So I feel like the the gaps that uh, should be more multidisciplinary, right? I feel like that is an area that many more people can start contributing to the accessibility uh, space. And I think, uh, you know, uh, options like the XR access are becoming more um, important for people to know that they, how they can bridge their, this gap. And I, I feel like, you know, you, you were saying here, um, we need more developers to be working on this. We will, we need a combination, right? Like it's not the community that can build their own uh, path forward. It has to be also on the trenches, people who are already working with the technology that they start bridging gaps. And I think uh, it, it seems more complex, but it also is more threadable, multi-threaded, right? Like it can go in parallel, it can grow. Uh, it has some potential there that uh, in short time, we can make a lot of impact if, I, if a lot of people get involved in this. Yeah, great. Well, I, I want to say, it looks like we got maybe like one minute, um, but I would love for us all to just take one minute uh, before we close things down to just think about and maybe write down, you can feel free to put it in the chat, like one thing you could be doing that we all could be doing to advocate for uh, greater accessibility in the workplace. And so feel free to just take that minute and then we'll, we'll wrap up. And uh, in the meantime, I'll be posting links to um, the panelists' work and to the Hub's experience uh, if folks want to check that out. And Dylan, Mara, Stephen, if there are other links you'd like to post, feel free. Uh, you're welcome also to enter our uh, Microsoft Research Accessibility Group, uh, which has also in the past done seen VR, which has been very interesting hack into um, existing VR applications to you know augment contrast or make things bigger or read aloud uh, the content, right? Uh, but the interesting thing is that it hooks into existing games, right? So it's not just a, a demo. Yeah. I'll share that too. Thank you. And, and thank you everyone for being here and for the work that I, I'm sure you no doubt do in your own communities uh, around this issue. Whether you're an expert or you're new like I am to the space, uh, I know it can be intimidating to dive into this work and put it out there for everyone to see. Uh, and the reality is that we're going to get things wrong and, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but the point isn't to get everything right. Um, the point is for more of us to be moving this work forward and, and to normalize it and, and to be designing these tools as we mentioned before uh, from the start. So uh, don't be afraid to reach out to me, to the panelists and their organizations, um, to the people in your own community communities and uh, to in, continue to advocate for inclusive technology. Um, I will be uh, moving over to the main room of the, the Hubs experience that uh, we posted a link for, and I've got about 20 minutes or so that I can take there to kind of introduce folks to 
to that experience. Uh, it's definitely a work in progress, but um, designed to just call out some of the considerations that are and advancements that are happening in VR accessibility. So uh, check that out. Enjoy MozFest. Thank you all for for being here. Thanks, Mike, for hosting us. Great panel. You bet. Thanks, Thanks everyone. No, Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for a great That's session. Easy, thank you. It's the difference between this, Candice stares ahead, and this. Candice purses her lips and rolls her neck.